This message is called Closer Than a Brother. Okay? It's the seventh, second last message in the series uh, titled uh, The Last Arrow. And just in case you haven't been listening to the series, in 2 Kings chapter 13 from verse 18, it says, Then Elisha said, Take the arrows. He's talking to the king of Israel who was being attacked by the Aramean army. And so he took them. Then Elisha said to the king of Israel, Strike the ground. So he struck the ground three times and then stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have struck down Aram until you had put an end to them. But now you only strike down Aram three times. This is the whole theme of this series. I believe every single one of us have battles that we need to deal with. It's impossible to live life without battles. Impossible. As the old saying goes, as you've heard me say a hundred times, you're either in a crisis, coming out of a crisis, or about to enter a crisis. <laughs> so you're going like, that's not very encouraging. It's just called the reality of life. But I continue to learn that it is crisis that makes me realize the importance of my God. I honestly believe if it wasn't for the crisis of my dad and his alcohol problems and violence, it would not have brought us to the place of knowing God. In fact, when I got to meet my uncle for the first time in London in 1987 with Sandra, and the family had never gone back since they came in 61, and I talked to my uncle because he was asking questions about our family and everything else. And he had tears coming down his face. And my uncle, Uncle Neville, he said to me, I'm sorry, Sean. I go, what? He said, if I'd known, I would have brought you over. And he wept. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I said, uncle, no. I said, if you had rescued us, you would have been our saviour. I said, because it was those circumstances that got my mum to work in the factory where they shared to her about Jesus and got her to go to church and get saved. And then she brought me to church to get saved. And my younger brother that next week, and this was the building where she worked, where she got shared to her about Jesus. So that's why I believe that it's the crises in life, the crises that we go through that create the opportunity for us to draw closer to Him. We either react or interact. If we react, we push God away. If we learn to interact, we begin to embrace. Not always understanding, but to embrace. I open this message by this statement. It says this, if we're not careful, we will spend our entire lives trying to find ourselves and never really come to realize that we never fully become ourselves until we find, till we find our people. You are my people. You are my people. In you being my people... I find myself. There are those who I love dearly who aren't here that still want to be my people. I said, I can't do my people with you. They may not love you, but you are my people. Well, what's the difference? Because you're there for me. And I want to be there for you. It reminds me of the story of David and Jonathan. And Jonathan was the oldest son of King Saul, the heir apparent. In any other scenario, Jonathan would be understood to be the rightful heir to the crown. It would be his birthright. It would be his bloodline. Yet there was another that God had chosen to be the next king and his name was David. It's easy to react towards David, but it wasn't David's fault that he was selected. It was because Saul in his crisis withdrew from God instead of drawing to God. It brought about a skip. In the book of Ezekiel, the book of Jeremiah says that our sons 
gnash their teeth from their fathers eating sour grapes. In Jeremiah and Ezekiel, it says, our sons or our children gnash, grind their teeth because of their fathers eating sour grapes. Life has been sour to our fathers and we the children gnash our teeth because of our father's reaction. I wanted to read a passage to you in 1 Samuel 18. It says, verse one, and when David had finished speaking with Saul, Jonathan committed himself to David and loved him as much as he loved himself. Verse three of 1 Samuel 18 says, and Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as much as himself. And verse four says, then Jonathan removed the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his military tunic, his sword, his bow and his belt. If you can imagine that David, who was a shepherd boy, who had his own clothing to identify him, was given the clothing of a prince, the heir apparent. At first, if you saw the shepherd boy walking around in the heir apparent's clothing, tunic, military sword, you would think he stole it. But then if you saw the prince wearing the shepherd's gear, you go, something is just not right here. There's something unique about this story. Plucked out from obscurity, selected by God to replace Saul and become the next king of Israel. It should have, in all natural forms, made David and the oldest son of Saul the greatest of enemies. They should have been enemies. Jonathan should have been saying, you're taking my birthright. I mean, it's the material from which generations of conflict are created. But yet in a strange and unexpected turn of events, David goes to Jonathan and tells him that King Saul, the father of Jonathan, intends to harm him. In fact, David says, your father wants to kill me. And Jonathan assures David that this could not possibly be true. He loves his dad. He loves his friend. It, it can't be true. But if it is true, Jonathan says, I'll use my relationship with my father to secure the information to protect you. How extraordinary. How extraordinary is the nature of this relationship and extraordinary cannot be overstated. A man who would value a friendship more than his own personal success. You can hear this and say, I can see that, but could you do it? For Jonathan, the question of who would be king is not in question. It's clear to him that David would be the one that God had chosen. And I sometimes think that we underpreach Jonathan, that we undervalue Jonathan's heart here because it has to take incredible strength, an incredible strength of character to be willing to give up something that in the natural worldly terms should be yours and yet to recognise that there's perhaps someone else better suited for the task. I can't not stress how unique this man, Jonathan, is. His allegiance to David is unequivocal. Whatever you want me to do, he says in 1 Samuel 24, I'll do for you. In other words, Jonathan's saying to David, I'm with you. Long before David was king, he had found his person. He understood the scriptures that there's one who's closer than a brother. David struggled with his own brothers. And there's several different theological views. One of them was that David was illegitimate. As David said in the Psalms, I was conceived in sin. 
illegitimate. It wasn't uncommon. Same father, different mother. So that's why he's on the outskirts. The obligation to look after him, but not sharing in the inheritance. That's why when the prophet said, bring me all your sons, David was left out. But this crisis, if it's true, allowed David to develop an intimacy with his God and realize that there's one who sticks closer than a brother. Now, Jonathan is committed to the greatness of David, even at the cost of his own fame and future. But this commitment that Jonathan demonstrated wasn't one-sided. This allegiance went both ways. We're told later in 1 Samuel 20, 17, that Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved them as he loved himself. Though David was one of many brothers, it was Jonathan who became closer than a brother. You don't choose family. You must always love your family, but you don't choose family. You must always love your family, even in the midst sometimes of ugliness. You must love them because that's what family does. It loves. But you have to also understand that we are a family. And that same loyalty is what we should extend one to another in the family of God. That sometimes there is an ugliness even in a spiritual family, but we still extend to each other that love. Over days and months, David would be joined by a legion of the greatest soldiers who walked in the earth in those days. This is what the Bible says in 2 Samuel 23, 8 to 39. From Shema, who stood in the field of lentils, which is beans I talked about last week, to fight the Philistines, to Elinor, who fought in a battle until the sword froze to his hand, and then Jehosh Bashebeth, who raised a spear against 800 Philistines in one encounter and defeated them all. There are three unnamed warriors who heard David was thirsty for water from a well near Bethlehem that was occupied by the Israelite army. Without being asked or instructed, they crossed the enemy lines to refresh the leaders first. And when they brought it back, he couldn't drink it. He just poured it on the ground as an offering to God. There's Benaiah who killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day, two Moabite warriors and the Egyptian giant. There are leaders of hundreds and leaders of thousands. There was an inner circle of 30 who were David's most trusted warriors. And then we're told there are the three, the three who stood at his side, who loved David more than their own lives and who David trusted with his own life. And the story of, Dave, of Israel seems to be wrapped up in the kingdom that David established. But let me say this. There has never existed a kingdom that David established alone. There has never existed a kingdom that David established alone. There are these mighty men. There are these warriors. There is a prince called Jonathan. What we remember is a young shepherd boy named David who went to face a giant called Goliath with a sling and a stone and he killed this warrior giant. And we remember David as the giant killer. And then we misattribute all of his success and all of his conquests to him alone. David killed the giant and he earned the trust of those who cowered before this ominous figure but the future that God was calling David to could not be fulfilled if he'd walked in battle alone. To fulfill the destiny that God had for David, he would need a band of brothers because our future is in people. Our future is in people. In a completely different context, 
we find the same existing principle in the lives of three widows who found themselves alone in the world after a famine and misfortune had taken the lives of everyone they loved and who had loved them. And we are told in the days when judges ruled that there was a famine that was so severe that it left these three women, Naomi, Orpah and Ruth, without fathers, without husbands and without sons. And Naomi instructed her two daughters and laws to go back to their own people and make a new life, a fresh start for themselves because she saw no future or hope for herself and felt that the best hope for the only family she had left was for them to go back to the families they had left. She had no ill against them, but for them to stay with her now would be unreasonable, too much of a burden. And in the midst of this moment, they all began to weep and wailed out loud in their sorrow. Now, not a lot is said about Orpah, but she is as responsible as Ruth is for her decision. Orpah kissed Naomi goodbye, bid farewell to Ruth, and went to find a people who she calculated quite reasonably would be her only hope for the future and returning to them, she would do nothing wrong. She was instructed by Naomi to go back. But Ruth made a different decision. Ruth, like Orpah, was a Moabite. In the Jewish Talmud, we are told that both Ruth and Orpah were sisters. We're told, in fact, that they're both princesses to the king of Moab. She had a people like Orpah that she could return to and look for help. But unlike Orpah, she said no. And she went with Naomi to an uncertain future. She understood that there was nothing more powerful than blood. There was a connection more important where a person came from. And she spoke those words that are echoed for human history. And I use it when I do weddings. In Ruth 1.16, she says, Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And it's from here that we have the book of Ruth. And it's because of this decision that Ruth's story demands to be told. Orpah chose a future that she might find in the people who were once hers. And that's what many of us do. When we face a famine or a crisis, we sometimes want to go back to a people that were once ours. Because we think that the decision we've made with a new people has gotten a little rough, we want to go back. That's the children of Israel and Egypt. We remember the leeks and the onions and garlics back in Egypt, but they forgot about the slavery. And Orpah didn't realize that going back was actually worse than just going forward in an uncertain future in the midst of famine. Ruth was going to make a new group of people for her future. She had no promise of a future and a hope. Naomi was bitter. She said, change my name to Mara, which means bitter. Naomi means in Hebrew pleasant, but she says, change my name to Mara, which means bitter. So many times we can find things in the body of Christ can be a little bitter. Instead of it being pleasant, it can be a little bitter. But we need to understand that it's still the people that God's attached you to. She expected that perhaps she and Naomi would die together. For Ruth, it was simple. In verse 17 of Ruth 1, she says, Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you from me. This was a young woman, or a woman. I don't believe so if she was that young, okay. But she was a woman that was prepared to lay down her life. And this story of Ruth unfolds like a romance novel. She works as a servant girl in the field. She was volatile. 
She was a foreigner. She could be raped. She could be attacked. There was no protector. There was a fear that she had. That's why Naomi says, go to the field of a relative to be safer. And she worked in the field of a relative of a husband called Boaz. And he sees her and is drawn to her. But when he realizes that there's more in here than meets the eye and falls in love of her, he recalls that there is another man who holds a position of responsibility to the household of Naomi. And that is both this man's obligation and his right to claim Ruth as his wife. And Boaz, I think the book of Ruth could have been called also the book of Boaz because I think he's remarkable. But Boaz cleverly convinces him that he doesn't want the burden of having to care for Ruth the rest of her life. So the other man relinquishes his position to Boaz. And in this way, Boaz claims the role of what is known as the guardian redeemer or kinsman redeemer. And Ruth becomes the wife of one of the most prominent wealthy men among his people. And Boaz, we are told, was the father of Obed. And Obed was the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of David. And David, of course, would become king. And it's from this lineage that the Messiah would come. And as we heard some months before, when we trace back through the Talmud and Mitzvah, the Jewish recollections, it tells us the descendants of Orpah. And it says, And Orpah went back to her father's house as a widow, and Orpah married into the Philistines and relocated. And just as the descendants of Ruth had one called David, the Talmud and Mitzvah of Judaism tells us the descendants of Orpah had a distant relative of a son called Goliath. And in that valley, when the two would meet, David and Goliath, who would have thought that the great-great-grandmothers were sisters? And both made the opposite decisions. One for what was fam- one with what was familiar, one that had risk. So often, when we think about the will of God or we're frantically trying to discern what God wants to do with our lives, we evaluate opportunities and never fully consider relationships. Who are the people you have bound your life to? Who are the people in your life to whom you've declared, I am with you? Jessie, her birthday is today, but she had a little birthday gathering with certain friends and family uh, last night. I think it started at four, was it? Sandra and I didn't get there till 6.15. We had a life group and uh, we were able to go afterwards. And what is interesting, as I went around, just hello, 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 I went around there, it's just to see those who are there saying, I'm with you. Just in a small group here or there. Not meaning others aren't, but just in that group. Who are the people in your life that you are bound to? The future that God wants for you will never come at the expense of the people he brings into your life. It doesn't mean you don't lose people along the way. It doesn't mean there aren't people you have to leave behind. But what it does mean is you don't have to live for yourself and yourself alone. Because whatever you do, you need to find your tribe. Jesse, can you bring the team up for me? If you are a zebra, or zebra, find the zebras and run with them. We'll notice you because you've got your pajamas on. Stripes. If you are a gazelle, then find the herd that runs at your pace. And if you're a lion, then find your pride. But finding your tribe is not about being of the same color or the same ethnicity or same history. 
It's about being of one heart and one mind. That's why I like Colin Lobb. There's a few years difference in our age. But I love that guy. He's funny. He's encouraging. He's honest, blunt, but in love. I've gone on holidays with him. Go over Fraser Island with him. Been through Asia with him. He's hilarious. But he's someone I love running with. He's a lion. And I like that pride. Whatever you do, whatever it takes, whatever you need to go through, whatever you need to do, find your tribe. I met some people, good people, the other day. Haven't seen them for maybe a little while. Reconnecting. And they were telling me about their life's journey and the challenges they're having in their life's journey. My heart broke because I felt like they don't have a tribe. They used to be in the tribe, but they felt a calling elsewhere, which is fine, it happens. But after talking to them after several years, there is no tribe. In the Japanese culture, they would call them a ronin. Now the ronin, R-O-N-I-N, has to deal with a group called the samurai. And the samurai is a warrior, and not, I'm not in any way um, endorsing <laughs> the, the Japanese culture of the Samurai. Zebra. Good try. Yeah, okay, very good. Okay, nice zebra. Okay. I'm not in any way stating to endorse it, but I just, I like history, read things. So the samurai are the warriors, a connection to a certain shogun. Shogun would be like a governor or a premier of a, an area, a district. Hmm? And the samurai are raised and brought up with that group. But if somehow that shogun was killed or the area is destroyed, then those samurai become what they call ronin. And the ronin means a warrior with no home, a warrior without the purpose, a warrior disconnected. There's a lot of believers who are runnins. They're skilled, they're able, they're trained, but they lost their tribe. The best future is waiting in your deepest relationships. And so many people desperately search for their person when what they need to do is search for their people. It's a beautiful thing to watch when two people don't even know they're searching for each other, but find each other when they're pursuing their purpose and have committed themselves to a people. That's what happened in the romance of Sandra and I. People say to me sometimes, how did you two get together? So, uh, you know, I sometimes uh, fib. And I said, I was a missionary in China and uh, Sandra was over there and uh, I got to meet her and shared to her about Jesus and led to the Lord. They go, oh, that's beautiful. I said, oh, I lied. Sorry, okay. You lied? I said, oh, okay, I'm playing with you. You're playing with me? I'm joshing. Thanks, Susie. No. Shannon and I met the same church with the same purpose. Felt a call to a tribe people, not there to find the one, but there to honour that one. And in us being there to honour that one, our paths crossed. Sandy was a little reluctant, (laughs) but that just made it more exciting. The lion and the zebra. (laughs) Just watch out for the hoof where they can kick sometimes. Ruth could never have seen that Boaz was waiting on the other side of Naomi and David could never predicted that it would be Jonathan who would stand between him and King Saul. And your ideas will change and your challenges will change and the world will change, 
But when you know who is with you and you know who you are with, you can face whatever is yet to come. And when you surround yourself with great people, it elevates who you are. If you want to have great character, surround yourself with people of great character. If you want to take great risks, surround yourself with a tribe of risk takers. If you want to live a life of adventure, then choose a tribe that makes life an adventure because you become who you walk with. If you want to be bitter, hang out with the bitter. So imagine the implications if you decide to walk with Jesus. When Jesus calls us, He never calls us to ourselves. He always calls us to a people and He always calls us to each other. So the question remains, who are you running with? Who have you given yourself to? Who are you willing to stand shoulder to shoulder with? Come hell or high water, who is with you? Who can you trust? Who's got your back? Who will pick you up when you fall? As Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12, he tells us how can two, uh, uh, how important it's never to walk alone. He says this, two, verse, uh, verse nine, are better than one because they have good reward for their efforts. Verse 10 says, for if either falls, his companion can lift them up, but pity the one who falls without another to lift them up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one person alone keep warm? And verse 12 says, And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. So it is essential. Above everything else you pursue in life, whatever else you may desire or long for, whether it's success, wealth, power or celebrity, to make sure that nothing in your life has a greater value than finding your tribe. You need to find your people because as long as you walk alone, you'll never know your strength. Your greatest strength is not when you can prove that you don't need anyone. Your greatest strength is when you no longer have to prove that you don't have to do it alone. There's strength in numbers. And there's strength that comes when you walk together with those who have one heart and one mind as you. To live the life that God created you to live, to ensure that everything within you is unleashed for the good of humanity, even if your ultimate longing is to find yourself, you have to find your people. You have to find your people. That's the key. You have to find your people.